morning and thank you and welcome to the second day of this workshop on hydrogen bonding. So in the first session we have three speakers and as have been explained earlier, uh, the speaker gave three five minutes followed by five minutes for from the Department of Inorganic and Physical Chemistry, IASC, and he's going to be speaking on halogen bonding in the thyroid hormones. Uh, good morning to all of you and uh, thank you Professor Vasudevan for the introduction. I thank the organizers, Professor Arunan for inviting me to give this talk. I am going to talk to you on halogen bonding in thyroid hormone action and membrane transport. So, I will be discussing about the application of halogen bonding in, uh, in biological systems, particularly in thyroid hormone activations. So, I will not be discussing more about the halogen bonding, the nature of interactions because to this, the, this audience probably that is not uh, required, you already know about the halogen bonding, hydrogen bonding and other uh, non-covalent interactions. I will start with a very basic slide about the role of uh, thyroid hormones in biological systems. Uh, as you see on the left hand side, uh, we know about uh, uh, the tadpole metamorphosis and uh, tadpole turning into frog is the process which is known as metamorphosis. And then it goes to adult frogs and uh, this is the frog cycle. And if you look at the conversion of tadpole to uh, frog, lot of changes should take place because tadpole is uh, it's, uh, it lives in water, cannot survive outside and frog can live both in water and uh, outside. And also lot of changes happens when this has to live outside, lungs have to be developed and this process is mediated by in the presence of iodine. And uh, when when we grow tadpole in water which does not have iodine and tadpole remain tadpole forever and it does not turn into frog. And this is the amazing changes that takes place in the presence of iodine. In 19th century, George Murray is an English physician. So, he suggested that He suggested that I will use the keyboard. Yeah. So, he suggested that hypothyroid, okay. So, he suggested that uh, hypothyroid patients, yeah, hypothyroid patients can be treated with extract of sheep thyroid, but the medical organizations did not believe this and they did not accept initially that. Uh, patients can be treated with sheep thyroid. And uh, the beneficial effects that he saw in a 46 year old man, old woman in 1891 and uh, later he treated many other people, the third and fourth patients died of heart failure. But unfortunately, sorry, fortunately for him, the first patient survived nearly 30 years and continued to use sheep thyroid extract initially by injection and later orally. So, this actually led to the development of the synthetic thyroxine which we are using now for hypothyroidism and uh, based on the success here, the chemist tried to extract the vital ingredient that time they did not know what is that that is responsible for this. Later on it was identified that it is thyroxine and thyroxine is the hormone which is responsible for the conversion of tadpole to frog during metamorphosis. And uh, later on uh, Kendall isolated uh, thyroxine. So, he won Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1950. He isolated thyroxine in 1914. He isolated 7 grams of T4 from 3000 kilogram of peak thyroid gland and a very small amount of thyroid hormones is responsible for all the biological processes that takes place in human body. This is a bit complicated slide. I will just tell you that it is produced in thyroid gland in response to a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone and that is the reason the thyroid level is always measured by measuring the TSH level in the blood. And then T4 is produced here and then it is bound to protein and this is where the halogen bonding comes into play and halogen bonding plays very important role in the binding, strong binding of this hormone to the protein is important 
because it is transported through the blood to various organs where the tissue specific and cell specific reaction takes place and they are important for many of the biological functions. And the entire body metabolism depends on uh, thyroid hormones and that is the reason if somebody has hypothyroidism low level of thyroid hormones they put up so much weight because the metabolism slows down. And uh, T3 if you look at the T4 and T3 structures. T4 the 4 number 4 indicates the number of iodine atoms and it is amazing how nature controls the number of iodine atoms to make it biologically active. Okay, thank you. And if you remove this is the pro hormone and if you remove one iodine from the outer ring it produces T3 which is biologically active. Why T3 is biologically active because only T3 can bind to the nuclear receptor that lead to transcription and mRNA and the protein expressions. So, all the cellular functions is associated with the T3 removal of one iodine from T4 and that is the first step in the thyroid hormone action. And uh, these enzymes which remove iodine selectively from thyroid hormones are selenoenzymes and again it is unique when you consider iodine is unique in biological systems because the nature chose the heaviest halogen atoms iodine leaving bromine, chlorine and fluorine and in the case of the enzymes which remove iodine selectively nature chose selenium leaving oxygen and sulphur which is amazing and uh, these 3 enzymes 1 ID1, 3 isoforms, ID1 remove iodine selectively from the outer ring to produce T3 and ID3 can remove iodine selectively from the inner ring produce reverse T3 and this is biologically inactive and this is active a perfect balance of these two is important to maintain the thyroid hormone homeostasis. If this enzyme is overactive, it lead to hyperthyroidism. If this enzyme is overactive, it lead to hypothyroidism. Therefore, a perfect balance of this hormone is important and why nature chose selenocysteine probably the low pKa of selenocysteine which is 5.2 as compared to the pKa of thiol 8.3 and then hydroxyl group in serine which is 13. So, it is a one atom change and you can see in nature many of the biological processes you will see dramatic effect in one atom change and in this case it is just one atom change sulphur to selenium that gives a dramatic ad, tremendous advantage uh, for the enzymes to perform the regioselective reactions. So, we were interested in functionally mimicking these enzymes with the synthetic molecules because when we started this work nothing was known about these enzymes and there was not a single chemistry paper in chemistry journals about the mechanism or the pathways of thyroid hormone activations. So, we looked at the active site models which was available that time later on uh, the truncated protein crystal structure became available. When we started the, our idea was uh, very rough and uh, we looked at uh, the active site of thyroid uh, deiodinases as you can see here the U, U represent the location of selenocysteine in the peptides and uh, this is considered as the 21st amino acid and we give U because this is incorporated into protein using UGA codon. And uh, after that there is a threonine and then this there is a cysteine. So, our idea was this cysteine what is the role of this cysteine in these proteins and can we put a thiol? in next, next to selenium like this. So, the like if you have a thiol here and selenol here making an, an intramolecular selenol sulphide bond whether we will be able to achieve the deiodination reactions and removal of iodine from thyroxine. So, we started with this naphthyl thiol and then we lithiated at this position 8th position and I, I, I added selenium powder to make the selenosulphide just like this one. So, that was the beginning of our studies and uh, I am skipping all the unsuccessful attempts it took 10 years for us to come to this level. And uh, what we did we treated thyroxine with these compounds and in phosphate buffer physiological pH at 37 degree Celsius which is body temperature and we found that and we there is a new compound produced and we were not sure about that when we run the HPLC experiments we found that there is a new peak appearing here in addition to T4 and this was the first time we could see a new peak when we treat thyroxine with a selenium compound. Before that all the time we used to get only T4 peak there was no deiodination. And later on we isolated this compound and characterized we found that this compound selectively removed iodine from the inner ring of thyroxine to produce a reverse T3. And if you take T3 again inner ring deiodination to produce T2 and highly selective to the inner ring. 
we were not able to remove the outer ring iodine at all. And this happens in physiologically relevant conditions and highly specific to the inner ring deodination. And this was surprising if you look at the X-ray structure of thyroxine and which is a unique molecule which is linked by an ether linkage and in biological systems this is the only molecule in human body that contains a diphenyl ether moiety and very unique and uh, you can see that all four iodines are exposed if you look at the outer ring which is perpendicular to the inner ring. So, all four are exposed this compound in fact can remove all the iodines, but it stops after removal of one iodine and there is no further deodination there is no change in the selectivity. So, we prepared a series of compounds you can see the one with the two sulfur here one sulfur one selenium and two selenium what we found was interesting when we substitute one of the sulfur with the selenium you can see the activity is increased by about 12 times, but when we substitute the second thiol with the selenol you can see there is 91 times increase in the activity and this, this led to an assumption that it is not just the selenium which is important, but what is there next to that is also important for the deodination reactions. When we block that with the phenyl substitution there is no activity. So, we wanted to check whether increase in the reactivity changes the selectivity. So, we used two different type of compounds this is very very effective and this is this is also effective. What we found is that whether use this compound or this what we see is the same trend. So, we see that inner ring deodination one iodine is removed selectively no further deodination and it stops there and we found that increase in the reactivity does not change the selectivity and this was the time we started looking at the mechanisms because already we published two papers the referee started asking what is the mechanism we want to know how does it selectively remove iodine from uh, one, uh, one iodine from thyroxines. So, that was the time I started reading about halogen bonding and uh, uh, you all know about it and uh, halogen bonding the strength of halogen bonding increases from fluorine to iodine because the sigma hole the positive potential along the C x axis increases from fluorine to iodine. And uh, this can also involve in halogen bonding as well as hydrogen bonding because the side the negative belt of halogen can form hydrogen bonding and the sigma hole can form halogen bonding such interactions are becoming more and more important in medicinal chemistry now. And we carried out DFT calculations on thyroid hormones and we found that all four iodines have sigma holes you can see this these are the iodine atoms all of them have sigma holes and uh, iodothyronine deodinases have selenocysteine residues in their active site. Selenium is a strong halogen bond acceptor and iodine is a strong halogen bond donor. So, therefore, it may be an optimum uh, interactions which is required for the deodinase activity. So, we propose that halogen bonding appears to be responsible for the deodinase activity. So, we, we did lot of theoretical calculations as well as experiments with the selenium 77 NMR and we found that when you have one sulfur one selenium or one sulfur there is an interaction here through the sigma hole you can see it satisfy halogen bonding because it forms almost linear arrangement. And you see that about 23 kilocalorie per mole 21 kilocalorie per mole, but this interaction is, is, is enough to stabilize this molecule, but not enough to cleave the carbon iodine bond because in our case thyroxine the iodine should be taken away from T4 and that means a carbon iodine bond bond cleavage should take place. And then when we carried out similar calculations with these compounds where there is an additional selenium or sulfur you can see that almost 3 times increase in the interaction energy here halogen bonding strength of the halogen bonding increases dramatically by introducing a group here. And we know in naphthyl system which is a rigid system and it is a peri interactions it is studied in organic chemistry for several years and peri interactions where the lone pair on this atom interact with the sulphur selenium here and which strengthen this halogen bonding. So, what we found was that when the lone pair on the selenium interacts with the sigma hole of iodine it lead to an elongation of the carbon iodine bond the covalent bond is 2.14 you can see it is 2.4 here and there is a shortening of the selenium iodine interaction it is 3.02 which is lower than the van der Waals 3.88 angstrom. And what we found is that if you have the selenium here this lone pair interaction to this iodine leading to the elongation of the carbon iodine bond that time initially negative selenium become delta positive when it donates the electron here 
and that time this selenium starts interacting with that. Initially they are repelling each other, but then they come close to each other to make a calcogen bond and that lead to the cleavage of carbon iodine bond. And based on this we proposed a mechanism in 2012 that T4 interacts with this through collagen bonding, but that is not sufficient to cleave the carbon uh, iodine bond. I have drawn just for convenience it is actually 180 degree here and then once this selenium interacts with the sigma star anti bonding orbital of carbon iodine bond this gets weakened and this carries more carbon ion character at that time this selenium becomes electron deficient the second selenium starts interacting with this leading to the cleavage of carbon iodine bond and then reverse T3 is eliminated and it forms an intramolecular disalinide which can be reduced back to the disalinol by using uh, reducing agents like DTT. And what we thought what happens uh, we wanted to check why nature stopped at selenium not tellurium okay when you go from oxygen sulfur selenium and tellurium the activity should increase so that means tellurium may be better than selenium because that will be much more active. So we prepared that uh, this compounds and this one where one sulfur and one tellurium and then we treated this with the T4 and we followed the reaction by HPLC and we found that there are many peaks that appear in the HPLC in contrast to the selenium one we get only one peak for reverse T3. And we also studied the activity of this and what we found was that T4 is converted to reverse T3 by inner ring deadenation, it is converted to T3 by outer ring deadenation and T3 is converted to 3, 3 prime T2 reverse T3 is also same it undergo further deadenations and finally we get a compound which does not have iodine at all it is T0. So the tellurium substituting a selenium with tellurium it removes all the iodine so there is no way we can control the selectivity and this is probably the reason why it stopped at selenium because optimum interaction between selenium and iodine when you go to tellurium it is too reactive sulfur is too less reactive. And uh, we also studied uh, uh, the deordination of halogenated uh, nucleosides and uh, what we found is that when, when we take halogenated nucleosides and changing the halogen atoms when we have a bromine it undergo the normal Michaelis addition elimination reactions to produce the dehalogenated nucleosides. But when we have an iodine it forms the halogen bond mediated pathway. So changing halogen atoms again the mechanism of the deionization changes and we also got x-ray structure with one of the nuclear bases where the lone pair interacts with the sigma hole you can see that this is the halogen bonding interactions with the nuclear base. And uh, now I will slightly change uh, the topic again stick to the role of halogen atoms and uh, the halogen seem to facilitate the transport of thyroid hormones from one part of the body to the other part of the body and the strength of halogen bonding is important and 4 iodine atoms forms much stronger halogen bond so it does not allow the hormone to be released anyway on the path. So it takes to the per particular cells and it delivered into the cells and how they get into the cells is interesting and what we thought using the halogen bonding using a heavier halogens like iodine can we improve the uptake of these molecules in mammalian cells. So we prepared these compounds with naphthalamide and you can see this is the place where we introduce the substituents. So we prepared a series of compounds the one without any halogens with the 2 chlorine atoms, 2 bromine, 1 iodine and 2 iodine atoms and we substituted this with uh, NH2 with the NME2 and so on. So what we did we calculated uh, uh, the you know studied the fluorescent properties I am not going into the details these are excitation emission wavelengths and uh, these, this, these are the fluorescent intensities. And when we found that the log p values because when we say introducing heavier halogen atoms the lipophilicity of the compound increases though it can just cross the plasma membrane. But that is not the case there is no major change in the lipophilicity of these compounds and but still what we found is that you can see this untreated cells and the cells treated with the compounds which does not have halogen atoms. And the chlorine atoms does not help much, bromine does not help much, but when we come to iodine you can see a, a dramatic increase in the cellular uptake that we observed in different type of cells. And you can see that up to 98 percent quantitative uptake and which is unusual because cells do not take up foreign matters like that and it is a complete uptake of the cellular, cellular uptake of the compounds. And that correlates with the sigma hole. So I am just trying to correlate this with halogen bonding, but iodine is certainly helping 
in taking up these compounds, but I am just proposing it is through halogen bonding. So, because uh, you know when we have a heavier uh, halogen atoms, it is possible that they form interactions, uh, they interact with the membranes. And we have done competitive experiments with the T4, you can see this is the T4, 4 iodine atoms, 3 iodine atoms, 2 iodine atoms, 1 iodine atom without iodine. This compound can be able to compete only when you have 4 iodine atoms and you can see that when you increasing the T4, the cellular uptake decreases and finally it blocks the entry of these compounds. But when we do not have, uh, when we have only 1 iodine or no iodine atoms, it cannot compete with that. So, this also tells that the importance of iodine in cellular uptake. So, then we proposed a mechanism of cellular uptake by using a specific inhibitor which is silicristin and this blocks an MCT8 transporter, it is a monocarboxylate 8 transporter that is very very selective to thyroid hormones and selective to compounds containing iodine atoms. And we found that this uses the uh, MCT8 transporter to get into the cells and we can put this compound directly into the cytosol which is not possible because any cellular uptake goes through the normal endocytosis pathways, it goes to uh, uh, you know uh, endosomes, early endosomes, later endosomes and, and lysosome, finally they get degraded in lysosome. So, it is not possible to put the compound directly into cytosol, but using halogen bonding, halogen atoms, we can put these molecules directly to the cyto cytosols because it use MCT8 for transport thyroid hormones which must enter the cytosol directly. And what we found is that irrespective of the fluorophore that we use, as long as you have the iodine here, the iodine substituted moiety here, we see an enhancement in the fluorescence. And in most of the cases, we see that more than 90 percent cellular uptake. So, what we concluded here was that chlorinated one 15 percent uptake, brominated 38 percent and iodinated 98 percent cellular uptake. And why these compounds are important? Because there is an MCT8 in the brain cells and that supplies the enough amount of T3 into the brain cells. This is the euthyroid brain and this functions normally, but if the MCT8 transporter is it's dysfunctional, the T3 uptake will be inhibited and it lead to hypothyroid brain and this lead to a disease called allen helden dotley syndrome. It is known since 1944 without knowing the actual cause. And some of the symptoms include slightly elevated TSH, elevated T3 and normal looking at birth and for the first few years, but cannot walk independently and become wheelchair bound by adulthood. And we can use this fluorescent molecule. So, now we are trying to use this fluorescent molecule to study the functional activity of MCT8. There is no fluorescent molecule so far available. And using the halogen bonding, we may be able to uh, study the membrane activity in these systems. And we were uh, over ambitious and we thought, can we put a protein inside the cells by using halogen atoms? And uh, we, uh, you chose uh, green fluorescent proteins, we substituted the tyrosine with the chloro, bromo and iodothyrosine and these are unnatural amino acids. So, therefore, the cells cannot take them to synthesize proteins, they do not accept the normal translational machinery does not accept unnatural amino acids. So, what we did, we changed the tyrosyl tRNA synthetase active site to accommodate these unnatural amino acids and you can see this, this molecular biology techniques, I, I will not go into the details. What we did is we put the halogenated tyrosine on the surface of green fluorescent proteins. And uh, these are the expression in bacterial cells, good expression levels, we purified them, you can see that gel electrophoresis and the perfectly matching mass spectro, uh, spectral uh, spec spectrum for this, these proteins. And this is the cellular delivery, you can see this is the chloro wild type, chloro, bromo and iodo, you can see that there is an enhancement when you have iodine atoms. And what we did is just one atom change and in this is if you look at the protein, the molecular weight of this protein is, uh, is about 28 kilo Dalton, 28,000. In 28,000, we just changed one atom, one hydrogen changed to iodine. So, what we found is that there is an enhancement in, in the uh, fluorescence, but what we found is that this goes to the normal endocytosis pathway, caviolin mediated pathway, it goes to uh, 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 you know endosomes and lysosome and they get degraded after 24 hours. But what we did, we treated the cells with an endosomalytic peptide which can release that from endosomes to the cytosol. So, we were able to get into the cytosols and even after 24 hours we see the signal. So, this what we are proposing is that this could be a new method 
to actually increase the uptake of macromolecules by using halogen atoms, halogen substitutions and uh, halogen bonding. And uh, this is the mechanisms that we proposed and uh, this is my last slide and what we are now trying to do, this is the slide that I wanted to discuss in the beginning but I brought it in the end because the thyroxine synthesis takes place in thyroidic gland. Right? The thyroid gland is the only place thyroxine can be synthesized and if somebody gets it removed for various reason thyroid cancer or something the person will not be able to survive uh, without thyroxine. So therefore the person should take synthetic thyroxine throughout the life and this is a very special cell only present in thyroid gland nowhere else in the body and it synthesizes thyroid hormones by taking iodide and introduced to the protein this is the thyroglobulin which comes from you know the normal protein synthesis pathway, this have hundreds of tyrosyl residues but what happens is that it gets out of the cells, it is called the colloid, the backside of the cells where the synthesis actually take place and it goes out and thyroid peroxidase iodinated the thyroglobulin, you can see the iodination and the phenolic coupling, finally the thyroxine is made on the protein but once the thyroxine made on the protein, it is get back to the cells and what we are thinking is that possibly a halogen bonding. Once halogen is introduced, the halogen bonding facilitates the re-entry of this molecule inside the cells and this is the key process in the synthesis of thyroxine and then they get out of the cells, enter the blood stream and going into the various part of the body to actually show the biological activity. So with that I thank the former students who worked on these projects and these are the current students and I thank the funding agency SCRB and thank you all for your attention. When you consider the mechanism for what's happening and the, for example, things like the separation distance between the, the halogen and the uh, selenium, do you have to consider the role of water as a solvent in a biological environment? Yes, uh, it, is, uh, it is role of water also the conformation of the protein because it is very difficult to correlate this directly to what is happening in the proteins because uh, it is also the folding because when in biological systems these biomolecules interact with each other which actually changes the conformations. And uh, further studies what we have done I have not discussed that today is that the conformation between the two rings, uh, three isoforms of the deadenases, uh, the selectivity because all of uh, all the proteins are selenocysteine containing proteins but how they remove one removes iodine from outer ring, one from inner ring. What we find that if you rotate this uh, two rings around the ether linkage, we see that the iodine can interact differently. So the strength of the halogen bond depends on the conformation and the role of water in enzymatic process uh, cannot be ruled out. It is it's quite possible that water may be involved. Hi, Mukesh. Yeah. I, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. One was I missed you when you said that uh, T4 does not get uh, uh, um, inside the cell but T3 no, does. No, no, they get inside the cells but they do not go to the nucleus. Okay, but T3 does Yes. and then T1 and T2 again they do not do what, what you expect them to do. Yeah, so uh, what, all of them what, get into the cells yeah. through the plasma membrane but they do not go to the nucleus and they do not bind to the nuclear receptor. So, only T3 binds to the nuclear receptor. So, it is not just a number but no. it is something about the T3. Yes that allows it to uh, get into the confirmation the of T3. So, is that known as to why this is so specific to T3? No. Okay. The other question was when it gets deiodinized, de yeah. does it cleave that as the iodine cation anion or the just iodine atom? And it, uh, it cleaves as iodine anion because if you look at uh, If you look at this, yeah, this cycle. Okay. So it takes up when when it interacts with iodine, it is I plus, I delta plus. Okay. What happens when this interacts and it forms a covalent bond, selenium selenium covalent bond? 
So that time what happens the iodine becomes iodine minus you can see it is some type of interactions like this and it eliminates as a HI okay. it is I minus. Okay. Thank you, excellent work. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Uh, it it depends on the confirmation. The initially in the native confirmation, what we see is that the two inner ring iodine, which are identical probably, and they form much stronger interactions than the two outer ring. But when we rotate this, at some confirmations, all four have similar tendency to form halogen bonding. But some cases we found that outer ring iodine forms much stronger halogen bond than the inner ring. Um. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you uh, explain why it extracts the inner uh, iodines and not the outer iodine? Yeah, that's in because it it forms stronger halogen bond with the inner. It's just the iodines. strength of the hydrogen bond. Yes, part. and but again, it depends on the confirmation. Okay. And the other question is not very much relevant to what you said. Now we take iodized salt. Yes. How does that iodine go inside? And uh, yeah, that's what the last slide I told you about endocytosis. The iodide gets into the cells through, through sodium iodide importer. And uh, when when iodine gets into the cells, sodium also gets into the cells. And that means that the sodium level is also altered by taking up the iodide. It takes as I minus that is why so when we take iodized salt it has iodide and that enter into the thyroid follicular cells through the sodium iodide importer. And then the iodide is used by the enzymes thyroid peroxidase to make the iodinated uh, thyroxine. Okay, thank you. Okay,